everyone and welcome back to another Sims 4 Speed Build video and today I am creating this suburban family house. I don't normally create houses like this. I do create American style houses and I do create family-esque houses like maybe like one, I mean like two to three bedrooms. I never truly create anything and the way actually I lied because this ends up being having three bedrooms but in my head it feels more expansive and it feels a little bit more different than the houses I normally wear. Like if, if, if you're reoccurring and um, watch it please tell me like if you go through my channel you can see it's a little bit different. It's not different in terms of the Sims community. It's actually quite a very Sims community type of build but it's very different from the types of builds I like doing because I'm not the biggest fan of doing like family households that aren't either British inspired or have a different architecture because in my head this build looks like a very Sims 4 type of build and I see now I have been so like I, I've been like I don't like doing builds like this because I can find them tight so and I do I probably won't make these builds very often but me being able to do this I realized okay I see why the community builds houses like this all the time they are so fun to do and they are so interesting and when you do finish them I think there's an aspect of me after I finish doing this bear in mind I've done some crazy builds this has been kind of been a bit of a show off for a second I've done a desert finish I've done Gotham City in my back hook at the moment I have one of the craziest builds I've ever made before in my life that even surpasses the medieval village the castle even Gotham City. Okay, maybe it might rival Gotham City, but it doesn't surpass it. But it's like near, it's like to the extent of Gotham City, um, the sci fi one I did. Like it's at that, it was a very, very powerful build. So I've done quite crazy builds before. So this is really like nothing against that catalog, but it is something that I finished doing that. I won't say it's the most proudest. I think the proudest build I've ever done is weirdly enough. I made this weird British house that's like all white and it's a bit like jagged and like sloped driveway and everything like that. And when you look at it, you'll be like, well, this doesn't look like your average bit of the British house. But the reason why I like it so much and I did describe it in the video and in the description why I love it so much is because I don't normally... I can build from like just like thinking of something like for example this I didn't necessarily have like a hard cover of what I'm thinking of when I was building it I just kind of knew that oh I'm in a very like American type of world I want to build something very American type of family type of house but with that weird British build in my head I was like I had a dream that I was living at that house and that house made me feel a sense of nostalgia also a sense of like fear and it it was this combination of feelings like that I could because if if you're me, that's always something that's running through your body a fear of safety and fear like I always feel a sense of this is my safe space, but I'm slightly enough. Like, I'm constantly in state of feeling enough. I think there's rarely ever a time in my life where I can... Oh, this is really bad because I'm actually really realizing it now. I, there's rarely ever a time in my life I feel completely and utterly, like, safe. Like, it's not that I've been in a fearful environment. I've actually been provided a very good environment. I've said this in a lot of my videos. But I have a very wild imagination. And it, like, I just... That and combined with my bad eyesight, I'm always just kind of on edge and kind of always paranoid. And I think what didn't help is that in my formative years, I used to just watch like, it wasn't even like any of the fictional media that really got to me. Except for the latest fictional media, long legs got to me, okay? But um, beyond that, um, it, it was normally like the realistic stuff that got to me because it's like these people are there, these people exist. So it's like whenever I'm... I'm more comfortable when there are people around me like right now at the moment my mom is downstairs whilst I'm in my room um and when normally when both of my parents are downstairs or even <laughs> it's gonna sound weird but if there's like a family function and everyone's like downstairs I prefer that because I like the sense and the feeling of there being people there Whilst I'm in my one summer, you don't feel necessarily like I have to perform and do certain things where I'm by myself, so I feel safe in that environment. But then when I'm completely by myself, this actually was cute. Why did I get rid of this? Why did I should have just I should have just done it this way? I feel like it would have looked a lot cuter. But you know what I've done it now. You know what I'll do another build, and I'll do one where the driveway is like 
how I've just done it originally. I think the reason why this driveway, oh no, I realize why I didn't keep this driveway. It's very awkward because of where I put the garage. The garage is all the way over there. So I've just got this massive like six car driveway and then you need to drive all the way from the from the driveway of the actual place where the lock connects but if, as you can see it actually dips into where it connects onto the road so it's just very awkward so that's why i ended up just making it more of an expansive um driveway but anyway like we say i hardly feel like it since it's not okay i'll change it i won't say it's not i don't feel necessarily safe i do but i just always feel like i'm slightly on edge like i've got a hint of paranoia for whatever reason and i'll say it's a combined effort of some of some of the documentaries of me have watched in my formative year and my very wild imagination i think it's more of my very wild imagination than i'll say it was of any of the documentaries just because I've had the wildest imagination since I was four. Like, I have these very, very vivid dreams, very realistic dreams. Dreams that are some got, like, lately they don't, they, they haven't in the last few years made me wake up, like, terrified and unable to sleep. But, like, combinations of, like, sleep paralysis and then very vivid dreams and things like that. It just kind of... <laughs> It's just kind of got to my imagination. And I did a whole entire dissertation about it, if you want to hear about it. I don't, I think I've switched up on it lightly, but I've never really delved into it. During university, not, I didn't do it from a dissertation. I did, my dissertation was more about liminal space and the utilization of the nostalgic media and the ethicalities within that. So, um, obviously within lately we've been watching a revival of a lot of media or the continuation of a lot of media so we've seen a lot of remakes we've seen a lot of book four book five the things that we thought generally finished we've seen a lot of like um a diversification of media that we would think is finished I, I for one i think harry potter we constantly see a diversification of what was once just a simple book to obviously movies tours games everything like every single time i go into social media i find out they've brought out a new thing um i see there's been like there's been obviously the remaking of disney films there's been revivals of old shows like there was like that's for raven there was a lot of things and i was basically talking about it in a liminal time especially with what occurred during 2020 what was what is the ethicality of utilizing nostalgia during that time? Because the liminal time is a transitional stage. Obviously, it can also reference to like actual liminal places like empty office builders, but even that adds into the transitional space theory. So what I spoke about in my dissertation was that these places with liminal space during that period in 2020 as well, they were all over TikTok. I, you saw the videos with that one song that was always in the background and the like empty office buildings and the empty malls and stuff like that. Like that was a huge thing because we were currently in a period of time where a lot of the places that are normally fully, um, filled with people were vacated. So it felt this sense of almost like dread watching abandoned it like the, the, the watching looking at abandoned things is very daunting and terrifying for someone because it's not even in the sense of zombie apocalypse like oh something's happened and now vegetation's going over it that can be scary like think of the 100 or think of stuff like that that could be very scary but then also think of things like stranger things or things like 28 days late or things where just people suddenly disappear like i can even talk about um the impacts it's not the impractical project is this one pro it was this one show that was on cbbc where all the adults suddenly disappeared and the kids were now in control the spartacle mystery project like even stuff like that where the sudden abundance of things that are properly fit that can cause a sense of dread because it's almost like where's everyone gone like that kind of feeling and even how my heart pumps thinking about it because I hate that feeling. But um, with during this time, that's basically what happened. Everyone was kind of gone, so it gives you the sense of dread. It feels like this, 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 this is not this is not a peak period. This must be something that comes before this and after this. This is not the period. This is a transitional period, especially when it was those liminal space hallways where it was those um back rooms and stuff like that. It was just like hallways, and it was just it also felt like okay, this is a transitional space. You're never supposed to stay in a hallway. You're supposed to move through it into the next place, but now. 
now you've got this endless airport hallway, this endless air, this endless office hallway, this endless school hallway, hotel hallway, corridor, whatever you want to call it. But it feels almost endless, and it feels like I should have left this place by now. But I'm not. I'm still there. The repetitiveness is getting there, and the isolation is getting to me as well. And that's the whole thing with liminal space. In, and then obviously again, that translates to the. Actual psychological meaning of liminal space is when you feel like you're in a transitional period. So that could be when you're finishing university and you feel like, "Hey, I don't know what to do with myself." Because again, it's been over a year. Like I've graduated university on the 26th of July, 2023. So it's been over a year now. Don't have a job. Got um. Got a place in a really good film school, but I couldn't afford to go to it and stuff like that. So I can, I still feel like I'm in the sense of, I'm, I should be in my next place, but I'm consistently moving. And it's not that I'm not enjoying this relaxing break. I'm absolutely loving it. But when I get out of the space of being in my room, when I get out of the space of being in where it's just like it's just the four walls of me. I see that how much of how much everyone else has moved on, how much everyone has progressed, and then you can feel the sense of oh, I'm not just in a room. The room is actually quite endless, and I'm in this transitional space in my life, and it feels quite lonely at the moment. Like there's probably a lot of people that can sympathize with you, but you don't see it when it's you. So you just kind of constantly feel quite lonely in it. So I, with my dissertation, I was talking about when people are in these situations, specifically in 2020, because a lot of people lost their jobs, a lot of people couldn't go to school, they were just feeling lonely, they didn't know when these restrictions were going to get lifted, so they just constantly felt like the days were melting into each other. Um, a lot of media came out, like podcasts, especially of revivals of old media, because we find solace in nostalgia. Nostalgia... If, Nostalgia is used to be a mental health issue. That was broached to me by my lecturer. It used to be a mental health issue because it's not necessarily healthy to constantly think of a old time in your life that you can no longer actually grasp onto. It's good to reminisce, but not to the extent that some of us may take it. And it can also be quite dangerous at times to see the past through these rose-colored glasses because we're constantly thinking to ourselves, "Oh, it was better back then." But I promise you, it probably wasn't. But we like to perceive the past as better because we can't conceptualize. The fact that the present is actually quite horrible as well, and the past was just as horrible, and maybe the future might be. But we might we want to remain as optimists. I like to remain as an optimist. I like to think there is gonna be good. There's always gonna be good in a lot of things, but it can be hard to grasp onto that sometimes. Especially again when you're in the liminal times, you like to think that. Before you enter the hallway, it was a good time because you can't see when you're going to leave the hallway. So before this issue that happened in 2020, you like to think life was better beforehand. It could not have been, but you like to believe it is because you can't imagine what life was going to be like after the end of that period. And now the period is finished. And now maybe you've finished either high school, you finished university, or you've just like left a job, and now you're in the position of. You're in the period between jobs, and you don't actually know if you're going to get a job next, or if you're going to get into uni, or any of these things. So now you don't know which door is going to let you out of this hallway. So even if a door is going to pop open, what I'm going to say for a bit of optimism for anyone who's listening to this, that might be a bit quite sad and about this, there will always be a door because. Someone had to build that hallway, and someone needs to get back out. You can't go into the past, so there will always be another door to exit out of. So, keep positive and um, just know there will be some way to get out. And maybe you will enter into another hallway, but it's always progress, and you'll keep going and you keep going. There's no hallways that connect into a circle with no other way, because then someone would just die because they made that hallway. Like it's gonna sound, it sounds a bit messy and not entirely、uh, making sense. But yeah, it, you can't make hallways that just connect and with no exit because the builders will just die. You, there is an exit, and you one day you will completely leave the hallway, and maybe it will change into a different type of hallway, and that's fine. But you will get out of it. So it's like, hey, but going back into the more this more aspects of this um this kind of ideology is that um within this period there was a lot of podcasts like. 
a lot of a lot of older actors um, reviving themselves, especially on TikTok, saying, "Hey, I'm this person who used to be from this person," and it was beautiful. It was honestly so common to see these people that you've adored, you've grown up with, um, doing just so well with your life. I love seeing actors that I have grown up watching their work from either the films or the TV shows, and they may be not doing any more acting. Maybe they're just, just chilling, and I'm just as happy with them chilling as if they were doing acting because some people just want to do one big role and just like disappear. That's okay, and some people want to just continue it on, or some people want to do theatre. I hate theatre. But I'm willing to give it a go. To be fair, I can't say I hate theatre because I've never actually been to watch a theatre show or anything like that. But when I think of, th- you know what? Actually, I I re I, I want to readjust my statement. I don't hate theatre. I'm just not the biggest fan of musicals. I think the only musicals that I like are The Cheetah Girls, Lion King, and any of the Disney Bratz musical. I I love Disney Bratz musicals, but that, that that's where my love of mu- musicals really lies. So if you give me like a Broadway show, musical, anything like that, I, I probably want my kid. And I don't like most of this dance musicals. So I, when I think in my head of, oh, this is the... When I think in my head of all of the... Am I almost finished? <laughs> Sorry, I'm just kind of... I'm just kind of worried for a second that I've almost finished the video. No, I'm not. I've still got time, don't worry. But when I think of musicals, um, I just think of Broadway and I think of maybe like high school musicals and stuff and I wasn't the biggest fan of them. I was when I was a bit younger, but then when I like turned 10, I just, I didn't like it. It's, I think the problem was with me in musicals, they, I never felt that seamless transition into musicals. Like, I mean, seamless transition into song from talking. It just always felt like, I, I can I, I can't like do you know how there there was this one video I say I watch I'm gonna go back to Luminous Space don't worry, but there was this one video I say I watch where they were talking about the reason why musicals can really perform well and how musicals can truly perform well is when it feels like the emotion becomes too much for dialogue that it has to be turned into song and I thought that was quite eye opening because I was like okay that okay that I could see that because. You're feeling so happy and ready to become the next Cheetah Girls that you're now singing. You're feeling all confident that you're going to be the next king. So you start singing or you need some kind of like um, exploitation or exposition. So you start singing. I can get that. But there are certain times in, I'm saying high school musical. I, it's not the worst thing in the world. But there's like a lot of times in high school musical, I was just like, you need to be singing right now. And a lot of times I just don't like the songs that are being sang. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to cause a lot of d- discourse about that. So I'm going to move on from the topic of musicals. But beyond, I was saying before that I enjoy seeing the characters of growing up watching, doing great things for themselves, joining theatre, do music, whatever like that. Maybe there is always going to be the sense of, I remember you as your original role or the first role that I got introduced to me, but I love seeing them progress within the careers, which is hearing that they're happy and healthy. Like that's what I really adore. Um, so that's, that was a great aspect of 2020 to see stuff like that. But then when you start to push it to an extent that it's almost like you're not letting people let go. It's almost like putting a bandage on a very, very big cup. It was to soothe the soul, to soothe the emotions, to comfort the inner child, basically, um, during this time, because when you, when you're scared, you, when you're terrified, you don't see yourself as an adult anymore. You feel, you feel like you're as, you're a child. You feel very alone and you feel, you feel very vulnerable as if you were a child. So it felt like in this instance, it was like putting a bandage on the, on the very big cut of the situation of all these people feeling so lo- lost and hopeless. I do not blame the celebrities for this. They're just trying to get that back. What I blame is the very the the um what I blame is not it's not even blame but what I criticize especially is just basically the break the break in creativity break in media break in art for the sense of reigniting that nostalgia to make a bag from companies not celebrities so a, a key person within this period was Dua Lipa she literally did the whole revival era of nostalgia and I do not hate that at all I think it's one of the best albums we've ever had in pop in a very very long time and I think that was a really great thing that she did so it's not on her but it's on 
every single company that basically pushed the artists that may not have wanted to do that to do that in order to capitalize on that bag unknowingly or knowingly basically pushing nostalgia onto these people that should necessarily not be in that state of mind they should be moving on but it's almost like the video's ended so i need to find a way to wrap this up there might really have to be a part two of this dissertation because it's a long dissertation but it's almost like um an ex or a family member telling you, like a parent or figure or an ex telling you, hey, it was good when we were together. It was good. Come on. Like, remember when we used to go to the park? Remember when I brought you ice cream? And it's great. And it's great. But you know at the moment that the person you're talking to needs to move on to the next stage in the life, but you're almost kind of like putting them back into this previous point in life or making them seem as if there is no other greater aspect of life than that moment in life. And I, I'm just going to sum it up. I completely forgot what I was talking about before. We got into this round about my dissertation. But just, uh, there's more. There's more. I'll do a part two maybe in the next video. But to sum it up, it's basically that with 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 this nostalgia, the luminous space and everything like that, it's not that I devalue nostalgia. I love nostalgia. I actually engage in nostalgic material a lot. I watch Peppa Pig like nobody's business. I'm listening to the early 2000 songs like nobody else. But... To capitalize on that, the ethicalities have to be questioned because not only are you ruining art by not letting go of previous art and exploring the new ways of art, not only are you destroying the ways of current people who are 10 or 15 or 11 or younger people creating their own sense of nostalgia, like there is nostalgia, can't be nostalgia of previous nostalgia, like why does I may love, I love Peppa Pig. And Peppa Pig is still running, but if Peppa Pig finished in when I was 10 and they did a revival for it, and our 10 year olds now are watching it, they need to generate their own nostalgia. And we may hate the new nostalgia. Like, I know a lot of people may not like Bluey, then may not like Coco Melon, but that's gonna be the nostalgia. And as annoying as it is for us, and as much as we may not like it, it's not for us. And in the future, they're gonna appreciate hearing the little dingy sound of Coco Melon or seeing the little figure of Bluey because that will become the nostalgia. And it's not, I feel like there's another issue and yeah, there is so much more to go into it. I might need to just dig around my station and find out more. But yeah, anyway, I hope you guys like this video. <laughs> uh, there is talk too much about it, but it's one of my favorite bills ever. I said this at the start. It's so pretty. But anyway, I'm going to leave. Um, Thank you so much for watching this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe. But if you don't want to, that's also okay. I appreciate you seeing this and listen to all of my rambos. Also, now we're going to leave a comment down below. I read all of your comments. The more, the merrier. And I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.